Welcome to the Sweet Tarts of Fighting podcast. This is the first live episode here, uh, airing live on YouTube and Facebook here with John Kiley. Welcome, John. Uh, thanks for the invitation. Pleasure to be here. No, thank you for coming on. I think what might be good to start before we dive into today's topic, maybe just a brief background about yourself and, and what you're up to, and then we'll go straight into periodization. Uh, so brief background, like a lot of folks, uh, had a, a career, a com competitive per career, uh, made it to international level, but extremely mundane, average, had about 15, 18 <laughs> internationals, was coaching young, was coaching around 22, 23, kind of in parallel with, with training as well. Um, when I was about 26, I, I, a sports science course started up in the local uni university for the first time. So I'd already been coaching four or five years, thought that would be good, wasn't really doing anything meaningful in my life. Did that course, came out of that, worked within the Irish sports system, decided I need to learn more, sold up everything, got my savings and a little broke open the piggy bank, moved to Edinburgh and did a master's there, back to Ireland, more work. Uh, 2005, uh, I was offered a job with UK Track and Field, so UK Athletics was the organisation, as the head of strength and conditioning for the Beijing cycle. So moved over there, stayed there 10 years or so. Again, hardcore practitioner, had never thought of being an academic or working in a university. But kind of old story, partner back in Ireland, me in the UK, travel over and back, travel to camp, to camp. Coach, coach's life. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so decided maybe I needed a, a, a bit of a pause on that. So a British university offered me the opportunity to work for them, but to do it from a small town, Ireland. So that's what I did pretty much in this room since 2012. That's what I've been doing, working for, now I work for a different university now, but the same kind of working process. I spend the vast majority of my time here and then I travel over and back as necessary. Nice. So long time coach, of kids, you know, amateur athletes. Uh, I've worked with, you know, top tier professionals across a number of sports. And then the past few years transitioned to working for a, a university. And that's pretty much it. Nice, nice. And, uh, and within your university, I guess within your academic research side, you're probably most well known for your periodization paper that you wrote. Um, that was over a little over a decade ago now on, on um, kind of challenging this idea of traditional periodization. I think what, where a good place to start might be what periodization is and isn't just for the listeners, just so they can kind of get an idea of where you sit on this uh, topic. Yeah, well, I guess it's just as a bit of background context to that paper. Mm -hmm. It was, I was a fully bought in, paid up, member of the pro periodization club <laughs> uh, but both as a kind of hard training athlete in a hard training sport and as a coach it just you know that type of thinking the typified periodization at the time just kept getting me into trouble <laughs> um, so when i wrote that 2012 paper i was i was an snc practitioner I was, I'd read somewhere that the average academic paper was re read by seven people. So I thought that's okay. I can handle seven people laughing at me, <laughs> uh, but it evolved, you know, and it took me ages to write because I was writing it at the weekends and things like that. And, uh, but it seemed to, to land with a lot of people in a way that I hmm. definitely hadn't expected. And the thing is, when you talk to coaches, there's this kind of, there was this big disconnect all the experienced coaches know, knew that, well, you know, we can't interpret this periodization research as gospel, but the periodization research was still portraying itself as gospel in yeah. a sense. Um, so I think my bit of writing just came at the, you know, like everything else, it just came at the right time through luck, but a lot of 
a lot of really good coaches responded really well. A lot of people didn't like it, but but that's the nature of the beast. Um, and really, I was writing that paper for the high performance coaches who really knew the game. That's what I had. That was the audience I had in my head. Mm. So, so yeah. So 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 that's the backstory to that. Um, in terms of what got me thinking about periodization, as I said, uh, I started off as a believer, uh, but I, I guess with just experience, and I, I tended to work a lot with athletes who were injured or athletes who were a little bit older coming to the end of their career but trying to squeeze out one last major champs. And it becomes very clear when you're working in those contexts that there is no rule book. Mm. And the more imagined rules you have in your head, the more poor decisions you make. Like the more you rely on generalizations and historical examples, the, the less deeply you think about the, pro the actual problem in front of you. Mm -hmm. So if, if I just kind of try and explain that yeah. a little clearer, there's a temptation, and, and I was at a track and field conference the, the past couple of days in the UK and we had a big discussion around um, thinking for yourself versus taking off the shelf answers and you know there was top level coaches at this Olympic World Championship medalist um, and they were all saying that you know you have to think it through from first principles you can't take an off the shelf uh, recommendation and the more mm. you take the off the shelf recommendation the more the more skewed your thinking and your answers will be and that sounds like a very common sense thing to say but when you look at the academic literature that's the message that you get you, mm. you don't get any kind of subtleties around well you have to you have to play what's in front of you it's like yeah this is your set of solutions. Off you go. <laughs> so I don't, I, I don't think I answered all your questions there, James. So if you just want to redirect me. Yeah, no, that, that that's a great uh, preface to, to this whole idea of periodization as well. But I was, I was interested in you diving into for, because a lot of the listeners are athletes themselves, just the idea of, of what periodization is and what periodization isn't. Okay. Um, well, you're after tapping into a key problem in the in the culture at the moment, and that is we use periodization, but it, it's not really well defined. Hmm. But uh, let me, there was a paper that came out recently, which looked at all the periodiz publications in the academic literature and what was periodization. And they were all different. I think there was like over a hundred of them. Okay, so that's a problem straight away. If you've only a, if you've over a hundred definitions of a word, that's a problem. <laughs> but uh, and this the type of nerd I am. I, I went through all of them, and they all have things in common. They all make one fundamental presumption, and that is the presumption that you, me, any of us can predict what is going to work best for this athlete. Mm. Not only can you predict what's going to work best, but you can predict what time frame it needs to go in. So it'll take me 12, it'll take me eight weeks to get their strength up to speed and then they'll be ready for this and then they'll be ready for this. So there's a whole sequence of presumptions that are normally founded on when you dive into the literature, maybe sometimes the trail goes back to some 1954 paper from the old Soviet Union. Or mm -hmm. it goes to this couple of studies with university athletes that really were just looking at strength training over a four, six, eight week period or something like that. And you think, well, you're basing this big conclusion on this ridiculously skimpy bit of evidence. And I guess to me, it just seemed like a sleight of hand, like a little, a little fake to say, well, look, <laughs> Here's this study that supports this, so this is true. Yeah. You know, um, and I think, okay, so that all sounds very negative towards periodization. It's not meant <laughs> to be. Where periodization started out was coaching an athlete, regardless of young, old, 
just one athlete or a group of athletes is ridiculously complex. It is ridiculously mm -hmm. complex. As human beings, we don't want to face that complexity. So we try to come up with rules. And I think that's why periodization was so easily embraced and so readily embraced was that, hey, this is really confusing. Aha, here's a set of rules. Here's a template you can plug your numbers into and it'll tell you what to do. And then you as a coach can go, okay, I've done my due diligence. Mm -hmm. We're up and running. But but that's not the case. The case is there is there is very few rules. I think there are some basic rules, but there's very few rules. And we've we've overdone it on the imagined rules perspective. <laughs> and now it's getting in our way. It's getting in the way of having a clear vision and making clear decisions. Yeah. Now, let me go back to one thing, and that was what is periodization. It is a form of prediction. It is predicting time frames, predicting sequence. So if I do this first, then they'll be more ready for this and they'll get better benefits from this and then they'll get better benefits from this. So there's time frame, there's sequence, and then there's a, an assumption that people will respond broadly the same to, if I give you and me and another, you know, other 30, 40, 100 people the same intervention, We'll all respond relatively sim uh, similarly. We all understand we won't respond exactly the same, but we assume we'll respond broadly the same. We also assume that we'll respond within a similar time frame, and we assume that the similar type of sequencing will work for all of us. So, you know, whatever classically strength first, power second. And the truth of the matter is, and this is like ridiculously clear from research the past 10, 15 years, is that we all respond in very, very unpredictable ways to the same training. And part of the discussion yesterday with the, the track and field coaches was, you can get, different people can get to the same place through very different routes, mm -hmm. or uh, the same, uh, sorry, what is, different people by different routes, or you can go to different places taking the same route, if you know what mm -hmm. I mean. So mm -hmm. it is the whole, the whole game of trying to predict what will work best for an athlete is fundamentally flawed. And that sense that we can predict it is at the root of periodization. Let me skip back a little bit. And I know I'm going on a bit now, but no, keep going. Where, where, where periodization came from, because I think this is informative, where it came from was, I think it was after the 52 games. I can't remember exactly if it was 52, the, the 52 Olympics. Soviet Union came second to the US in terms of the medal rankings. And, and that was a problem politically. So they tasked, this young PhD student, a guy called uh, Leonid Makfiev, people will have heard of, and they gave him access to a lot of stats, a lot of figures. In these three, it was three sports, and in these three sports, these thousands of athletes, here's what they did, because they had the records, and here were the ones that achieved, here were the ones that weren't achieved. And Makfiev did what was sensible at the time, and make those assumptions that, well, you know, everyone will respond broadly, to, you know, in the same way. And he just, he just did the maths. He just got the Excel sheet or whatever was 1956 <laughs> um, equivalent and worked out, this is the best thing to do. These are, this is the best phase length. This is the best type of training to do in this phase. And that's where it came from. He, he then wrote a book, Fundamentals of Sports Training, Soviet Union for lots of different reasons, you know, good, good reasons in terms of they probably had the most widespread PE program. They were probably the first to have professional coaches as a really respected profession and all the bad reasons we know about as well with the old Soviet Union. But for some mix of those reasons, they were at the top of the sporting tree. US and the Soviet Union flip-flopped um, over the next few Olympic cycles in terms of one and two. 
Soviets never got dominance over US, um, despite what, you know, that's what Matfield's work was supposed to do. But that's where it came from. That's where the, the concept came from. It was a very old type mm. of mechanistic thinking. If I do this, then this will happen. If I do it and it happens for me, it'll also happen for you. It'll also happen for all these other athletes. Let's just scale this out. And that's what they wanted to do. They wanted a system that they could farm out to everyone and say, do this, mm. do this system. No, that so makes, that's that kind makes of sense. A, a whirlwind. Uh, yeah, like it's yeah. a whirlwind tour, you know, but, but that's it. Not for sure. I, I guess there's another piece to that. And then the piece was, you know, if you go back to 70s, 80s, Soviet athletes were, you know, nip and tuck with, the, with Western athletes, but they were perceived as the most professional. They were perceived as um, in advance of the West. And they were in some ways in terms of their academies, their schools, their PE in schools, the professional coaching ethos they had. But they were way behind us in a lot of ways. You know, mm. where you had Western coaches who were um, intuitive and creative and uh, worked with the athlete in front of them rather than on this average, non-existent, yeah. typical athlete. They were getting the same results with much less resources than the Soviets had at the time, but that wasn't really recognized. We thought the Soviet system was great. You know, Matt Field's book gets translated to English in 1980. Lots of coaches embrace it because all of a sudden it's a solution to this complexity problem. Okay, now I, and there was the assumption that it was supported by research, which it wasn't really by anything meaningful, mm. at least by today's standards. So we bought in. It was like, uh, you know, the, the Soviet secret to success. Yeah. And we bought in. Yeah. And it's, uh, still, it's uh, still biting us in the ass. Yeah, no, having lived in Eastern Europe recently, before getting back to the podcast, I want to let you know there's a link down in the description for the Sweet Sounds of Fighting underground community. You can get all the help you need for your combat sports training. You get every single Sweet Sounds of Fighting training program, online course, and you get access to a range of coaches within the private Discord community. So go check that out and back to the podcast. So yeah, I mean, I've seen a lot of that in action in terms of uh, it's coaches, just the athletes like another cog in the wheel. They just do this program. Everyone does this program, and that's just how it's done. And I mean, it's yeah, it's still like that over there. So it's hasn't hasn't changed much. Yeah, I mean, I mean it, it's interesting for me because I I kind of. Uh, I, I've worked in a number of different sports now. Every different sport has a sporting culture seems to have a different interpretation. Mm. But so much of what we do and so much of the decisions we make is bound up in history. It's bound yeah. up in tradition. It's bound up in how we trained or how we were coached. It's bound up in a set of a set of beliefs that we haven't really looked at and scrutinized and pulled apart and thought, well, why do I believe that? Is it just mm. because it's what we always did? And I think that's really the problem. And I don't think there's any problem with the coach using periodization, but not thinking that that's all I need to do is, you yeah. know, do this template or use this Excel and set it up like this. That's not it at all. I think the much more important thing to plan is, well, where do I build in change? How, how am I going to be able to pivot? Because if I, one thing I will guarantee you, if you were a coach who spends hours and hours and hours planning, you're going to be slow to change that plan. Mm. You, you will have invested. It will be, uh, and it, you will have invested heavily in that plan. And that makes it harder from a decision-making perspective to pivot. Yeah. So one other thing that I think is really important, uh, and, that typifies periodization logic. Periodization logic typifies the political logic of the time, the scientific logic of the time. Mm. And that is the scientific logic of the time was there was a separation between body and head, what you call the biomedical model. It was like, well, pain is directly reflective of tissue damage, for example. 
if I do mm -hmm. this amount of training, I will get this proportional output out the other end. And of course, we knew that, well, nutrition matters, sleep matters, etc., etc. But it, that biomedical model totally disregarded. It thought of mental problems, psychological issues, emotional issues. There's something that happened from here up. Mm. The body, that starts from the shoulders down. But what's more than clear now in the research outside of sport is that how you feel about training, how you trust your coach, how you feel invested in your program, how you feel this training connects with your overall purpose. They're fundamental drivers of training adaptation. They're not fuzzy, nice to do's. They actually affect how you respond physically to training, how mm. much muscle grows or tendon responds or how easily are, are, are the difficulty level at which, at which skills are embedded. So there's a whole uh, belief, trust, faith, purpose, stress, not stressed, all of those non-physical factors are, you can't separate them from physical training. They are part mm. of how you adapt to training. And it's very similar to kind of nature versus nurture. You can't separate them. And the more you pull them apart and see them as distinct things, mm. the, the, the more skewed your, mm. your thought process becomes. And I think from a coaching perspective, this is a good thing. Because it gives you other dials that you can shift. So somebody not responding to a training program now, if they believe more in that training, if they're educated a bit more to understand the rationale underpinning that program, if they understand better um, how it's going to lead them to their overall purpose, all those type of, type of things will enhance their response to that training. If their belief goes for whatever reason, this isn't working, I got injured, my back is grumbly, those things will inhibit their ability to respond to that training. Mm. And not That's in some, well, for me, it's, you know, there's two parts to periodization that it was nobody's fault, but culturally we thought, well, you can predict adaptation because all of these thousands of people, when they did this type of training, on average, this is how much they responded. So, and that was the biomedical model and mechanical thinking and blah, blah, blah. Now we're in an era of, well, we don't use the biomedical model anymore. There's still a legacy in medicine and in other pursuits, but we're still buy into it in sport, uh, or definitely in terms of sports planning. But there's a huge, um, we can't predict. And how you feel about your training directly affects how you physiologically, neurologically respond to that training. There are two concepts that are not, were not part of the periodization conversation. Mm. You, you also mentioned uh, about basic rules and imaginary rules of periodization. Do you want to maybe dive into a little, uh, just a couple of the basic rules? Well, uh, I guess basic rules in my head are you need to think deeply about your starting point. You can predict what will work with this athlete. Mm -hmm. But you need to be very careful on your starting point. If you start, and this is, you know, you see it across the world, across sports, pre-season training. Okay, we're going to, we're going <laughs> to beat <one>. people. <laughs> yep. And then it's like, you know, it's craziness. So yep. it's more, for me, it's, I'm going to spend more time worrying about my starting point than about what I'm going to be doing in four weeks time or eight weeks time. I'm going mm -hmm. to consolidate that starting point and then I'm going to grow it. But I'm going to do that in the knowledge that I can't grow it quickly. Yeah. If I grow it quickly, I run into problems. Now, sometimes, you know, you've been injured. The Olympics is closing in on you. You have to make uh, some hard decisions but you make those decisions with the athlete. And it's like, okay, but we're going to be increasing the risk here, but these are the benefits. And if you want to perform like this or get this standard, then we need to take risks. But you do it knowingly and in a, in a shared kind of um, co-ownership type way. Uh, yeah, okay. 
do you want to redirect me there? My yeah, no, that's good. That, that, yeah, yeah, for sure. Uh, do, are there any other basic rules you have around periodization? So you've got the starting point. Is there anything else that you like to, I guess, use as a guideline? Well, like I wouldn't consider the planning that I do as periodization. It's more yeah. Um, this is perfect. Let's go down that road. It, it, it's adaptive. But I understand that, you know, if you're working in, let's say, the US collegiate system and you're working with 200 athletes, you can't individualize periodization programs or, or any training program. But I think what is totally acceptable to do then is you just make a best guess. And if you, mm -hmm. if you like the sound of this particular type of periodization or somebody's different type of periodization, then use it. But I think you have to have, it's kind of a, there's a difference than if you believe it is the best or you believe, well, no, this is just pragmatic for now because it's helping me manage what otherwise would be a completely, you know, an avalanche of problems or I just could not do it with the time and brain space I have available. So I think in those contexts, it's okay to use a periodization uh, program, but I think you need to know the flaws. You need to know the flaws so you can think your way through that program and go, well, maybe I'm not going to give them a program for four weeks. I'm going to give them a program for two weeks. Mm -hmm. And maybe I'm not just going to give them the program, but every session for the first three minutes, I'm going to give them a briefing. And in that briefing, I'm going to slip in some education. I'm slipping in some education. So I'm kind of growing their, their background training knowledge. I'm growing their background training knowledge so I can get good feedback from them. And so we can have more evolved conversations and those conversations can lead to you as the coach and then eventually once they're, you know, um, well educated in, in training context at being kind of co-owners, co-decision makers, and then you can farm out responsibility. Okay, uh, go through your normal routine, pre-warm up, do your normal warm up. Then we have a 30 second conversation and we'll, we'll finalize today's program. That type of thing, you can scale that, uh, but you can't do that with an athlete who hasn't been educated by you to think yeah. in that way. If they're thinking, if they're in that old model where the coach is the font of all knowledge and the coach mm -hmm. will tell me what to do and I'll just do that, you need to educate them out of that. You need to educate them you need to have shared terminology so that when you have a conversation, you understand what they're saying and they understand exactly what you're saying. Mm -hmm. So in a sense, what I'm suggesting is we have a planning model historically that's one dimensional. Here's what you're doing physically. Mm -hmm. What I'm suggesting we need is a multidimensional planning model where it's okay. Here's our starting point. It's safe. Some, some, sometimes it won't be safe because of timelines, but it's yeah. entering into that discussion with the knowledge that we're going to have to take risks. This is the last season of your career. This is the last event. We got to go for it or not, but it's your call. That type of thing. Um, okay, so mm -hmm. how am I doing there? Do you want to redirect me? No, you're good. You're good. I actually wanted to ask you a question on the idea of I think when most people jump into planning the training program as an athlete or maybe someone who's not as ex experienced in the space is they jump straight to like a block periodization approach to go, okay, I'm going to do a hypertrophy phase, then a strength phase, and then a power phase, et cetera. And I guess, I guess it's termed a, like a phasic approach to, to training. Is there, is there any evidence suggesting that going from, say, a hypertrophy to a strength or strength to a power is any more beneficial than just other var variations of periodization? I know like... In terms of block periodization, I'm, I'm not so much of a fan, especially for uh, mixed sports, you know, like rugby, et cetera, et cetera. But I think a lot of people jump down that road anyway. So it might be interesting just to hear your take on that idea of, of moving through phases like that. No, I, I, I don't think there is. Like there isn't for me, there's no type of quality evidence for that. Yeah. I think what, what there is evidence and where experience and common sense would point you as well is we can't do too much too soon. Mm -hmm. We have to be patient. We, you're, you're, you as, as an athlete, you will only have a certain amount of 
you will only have a certain capacity to adapt to training in any given time. Yeah. So, for example, uh, in every sport, there's a lot of legendary, you know, performers who won gold medals or won, you know, lots of awards who did monstrous training sessions. <laughs> and there's kind of a tendency to focus in on those people and try and emulate what they did, which is, you know, completely does not make sense. What worked for one person will not work for you. What worked for what one person could tolerate will break you, or mm -hmm. vice versa. Um, so I'm after sliding off your question again. There, do you want to just put <laughs> yeah. me back in the just, right direction? Just just around the idea of going through phases like hypertrophy and into strength oh, yeah. and into power. The the only time I would think of those as useful are two two times. One is if if it is pragmatic for you from a time perspective or a communication perspective if it's lots of athletes that say we will do this here and then we'll do this and we'll change it if you if so if it's that type of squad scenario it works because it's pragmatic uh, i don't think it works best biologically or neurologically i think if you were also if you're working with an athlete who maybe is new to your camp or something like that come in from a different club it's important to take their beliefs and considerations into account. So if they believe they need to work in, in those type of time frames, mm. I'd be inclined to go, yeah, maybe that's okay. But gradually over time, I'd engage in conversations and find out why they believe that. And then maybe if appropriate, look into either change their beliefs or, or my beliefs. So, so yeah, it's it can be pragmatic, it can be simplifying, yeah. but if if the question is, is there a benefit, for example, of doing doing all strength and then transitioning to, I don't know, whatever uh, power. It's clunky for me. It's very clunky. Hmm. Now, if it's you working one on one with with a really high performing athlete, then it would be, well, you know what we're doing. We're going to change percentages, you know. Uh, 40% of our program is going to be, of our, let's say our strength program is going to be robustness, just keeping you resilient, but in a non-fatiguing way that doesn't inhibit your event-specific training. Some of it is going to be, I don't know, if we've identified some muscular weakness, we're going to address that. Some of it is going to be, okay, so here's more event-specific power type stuff. And what I do over time mm. is, because variation is good, but it's got to be handled well, I would moderate those percentages mm -hmm. that's an example now that's a more fine grained fine grained way of handling the issue of well we need this exposure and this exposure and this exposure but it's a lot less clunky than we're going to do this for eight weeks and then we're going <laughs> yeah. to do this for eight weeks and assuming that there's some magical progression you know between i'm doing all slow but really heavy and now i can do my power stuff faster I don't think that's the way either brain or body work. Mm -hmm. Can I just ask if that kind of answered yep, that that's question? Perfect. That answered okay. that perfectly. Yep, I'm with you on that too. And yeah, it's it's one of those things that I think a lot of people just fall into. Like it's almost like a trap that people fall into there. But I think it's interesting as well. You talk a lot about variation within the paper. And I know if, if uh, I think it's an Isherin's block periodization book, he talks about uh, for training load being intensity volume and variation being one of the variables there to essentially spur progress and i know i had martin bingaser on last year if anyone wants to go back and listen to that where he trained under uh, bondachuk and he talked about variation being within periodization being variation being that thing that can just essentially create change within your program i wonder if you're able to just dive into a little bit around the idea of variation within training you know i guess the balance finding that balance between too much not enough perfect uh, just as a note to any listeners, I would, I'd recommend going back and listen to Martin's conversation with you. I mean, I haven't actually heard that conversation, but I know Martin, and yeah, uh, he's in a unique position in terms of he's a periodization theorist. Effectively, he's a high-performing athlete, or, yeah, or has been for quite a while, and trained under Bondarchuk. Mm. So there's kind of a unique perspective there, and it's yeah, really definitely. interesting to to hear his thoughts on that. Um. Yeah, variation, it's one of these things, it'll be, yeah, too much variation, 
what happens. Your adaptive energy is spread too too thinly. You don't really get anywhere. Maybe you improve, but that improvement is because your adaptive energy is spread across a number of different activities. You don't really get really good at your target activity. So the mm. way it works in most sports is at the start of the season, there's a lot of variation. Then coming towards competition, it's kind of a, a pyramid, if you like. Yeah. Um, there's very little and it's much more specific. But there's lots of other potential models. There could be, and again, these will all be with uh, maybe senior athletes, uh, as in high performance athletes. You could be, I need to be specific. I need to stay in touch with my core event and core intensities throughout the season. It does not make sense to go away from that. If I'm a triple jumper, I can't enhance my technique if I'm going at just 90% of full throttle, for example. And that mm. happens in all sports. If, I want to, if I'm a footballer who wants to enhance my deceleration ability, I can't be going slow into a, into a turn or a stop. So for me, there's good logic to say you should stay in touch with your core movements and their core intensities all the time but the volume can be very small hmm. where we clearly run into problems is when we have these sharp changes this block is over going to give you a few days easy and then we're going to go hard again in this new block and all of a sudden we've introduced something new in this new block variation is good when it's managed well you need variation to keep adapting to be to stay yeah. robust but if those variation changes are sharp, and it is the oldest story in the book, we changed our phase, and then two or three weeks later, people start coming down with, with injuries. Why? Well, because you introduce something new they weren't used to. That exposure generated fatigue. I got a little fatigue in my calf. That changed what I was doing around my knee. I kept doing reps. All of a sudden, that turns into a sore point. There's another compensation. Boom, something in the chain goes. Yeah. So it's not just a case of saying variation is good, variation is bad. It is a situation of it needs to be the right amount for this athlete spread over the right time. Mm -hmm. And again, you know, anytime I kind of say something like this, I feel like it's not a good message because it is, it's putting the load back on the coach. There is mm -hmm. nothing you can read about variation in a book that is going to tell you how to manage variation well with your athlete in your context. So the, the easy thing to do and the way to save the kind of discomfort of having to make a difficult decision is read it in a book and do it. You know, the book says four weeks, the book says 12 reps, whatever it is. But really, we know every individual context, every individual athlete are, are unique. So for me, good coaching is all about doing the hard work where the hard work is. I need to think about this. Mm -hmm. Now, I think there's one qualifier I'd add there. You can't think about everything as a coach. So it's just picking your battles and go, I'm going to think about this problem now. I'm going to park all these problems and keep doing what we're doing. But that's a work on for me. I'm going to come back to that at some stage. Or it may be that you get a, you you talk to another coach, or you learn something that changes your mind. But you're in the middle of a phase, mm. and then it's a judgment call: Do I actually go and change things now, or do I stay until the end of the phase and then work it into my program? Yeah, and I think that's really important because I, we need to be when we coach. We need to be aware of how we're presenting to the athlete. If we're presenting to the athlete as either dogmatic, like I know I am the way, the truth and the light, it might work for a short while, but they'll see through it eventually because you're human and <laughs> you make mistakes. Or if you're at the other end of the spectrum and it's like, oh yeah, I read this last night, so I'm going to change this. And mm. it's like new <laughs> fads and new tools and everything is changing. And then the athlete is going, whoa, hang on a sec. You know, you're supposed to know something about this, but we're changing every week. Yeah. So I, for me, like good coaches have kind of split personalities. It's like the way I present to the athlete, which is I'm calm, I'm confident, I'm clear in my communications, 
I'm invested in them. I want to know their perspective. Uh, I, I educate them. I farm out bits of education to them, you know, through conversation. But in the back of my head, I am running around in circles, screaming, going, uh, I don't know if that's the best thing to do. I don't know if this will work. So you have that <laughs> that's insecurity. The, that's the inner talk of every coach, I can tell you right now. <laughs> yeah, well, is it, well, I don't know, but I think it's the hallmark of every good coach. You know, it's True. like, how do I make sense of this? But the way you present to the athlete is, here's what we're going to do. Here are the reasons. I've already, you know, we've already talked about this, et cetera, et cetera. So it's how we present and what's going on in the, the little person in our head. They're very different and... Yeah, I say this. I say this because, and I think it's worth saying because uh, it doesn't always happen. A lot of times we drop our guard because sometimes mm. we treat coaching as something that's kind of a reflection of us. We're so invested in it. Maybe yeah. we've been athletes. It's like personal, whereas yeah. I think we should treat it more like when you go to work. You kind of hang your ego on, on the. You know, you you try and push your ego aside and think, you know, it doesn't matter necessarily what I think. It's that we collectively make the right decision, make the next right step forward. And I think coaches find that hard because we're all so invested in it. Sometimes it's hard to kind of park your ego, park your beliefs, park your personal investment and think, you know what, I'm standing in front of a group of athletes now. It's kind of game face on. It, it, this is not, this needs to be professional rather than mm -hmm. if I'm just talking to a group of friends. Yeah, no, th those are good points too. And I think, I think one, one paper that you referenced within your paper that kind of gives variation, a, it kind of illustrates a lot of the, the points there. So I remember when the paper came out as well, I think it was from, I don't know how to say his name, Ron Start. I think it was him. The one where they did like four or five high intensity interval training sessions a week, um, for how many weeks it was like okay and the conclusion was block periodization is superior to other forms of periodization and then you obviously you look at the paper and it's like well if you take anyone who hasn't been doing high intensity interval, interval training for any meaningful frequency and you chuck them in and do five times a week of high intensity interval training yeah you're going to see these huge adaptations but the question comes after that what do you do because you've literally just like taken the all the athletes energy to do this one thing for a whole week and then after that to make progress you just have to stop and maybe just reset and look that's a great example and i've actually myself and uh ben ronestad presented together in a conference in september mm. so oh, we wow. had a kind of well, yeah because the conference wanted us to go versus a debate oh yeah <laughs> but i was saying look i, I i'm not doing that that's because it's like academic fisticuffs and everyone yeah. seeing how i didn't piss basically um so 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 we met up before time, before time and talked and he made exactly those points. No, no, well, this was just an isolated study, uh, you know, oversimplifying. And he was totally aware of that. So I would mm. say that, you know, while people could interpret the, the study like that, I don't think that's what he actually thinks. Mm. Now, okay. you mentioned the Azurin and I'm a bit more critical of Azurin not against him personally, obviously, but I do feel he took little snippets, uh, like like a lot of people do, carefully selected research, yeah. and then to build it into a, a storyline, and that I'm not into. It's like, where's yeah. the weight of evidence? Don't point to one study in 1956 that I can't find and tell me that that's proof of this, because that doesn't wash. And it shouldn't wash yeah. with any coaches. And the only reason people accept that level of that low threshold of evidence is if they really want it to be true. Yeah. Well, that's why Martin you know, and I are writing that, that paper on training, training residuals that you've, you've helped us kind of give some comments on and, and directions on there. Because obviously when you look back, when you look at the current research on detraining values of a lot of these things, it's far different to the arbitrary, you know, number of days that are provided in that table. Well, the, I mean, residual uh, effects are a great example. So again, and I'm, I'm not beating up on this one here. I, I really don't want to, but he referenced a 1991 paper by the councilmen, you know, 
dark councilman, the you know legendary swim coach and his son, where they mentioned this phenomenon called residual training effects. So residual mm. training effects, mm. if we do this type of training for this long, the effects will last for this amount of time. Now, that's not mm. what councilman said. Councilman said is that they will gradually decay if you don't keep training them. What Asuran did was put numbers on it. I forget, maybe yeah. 7 to 14 days. Councilman didn't go near that. Councilman was only writing from his experience. He'd never done a study on it. Mm. Asuran said that this is a new concept. Okay, so me being the nerd I am, I went back to the literature. And there's reviews there from the 1930s saying, you know, when these farmers worked in the field, their arms got bigger. The exact same thing. When they stopped working, they got smaller. And, you know, it's ridiculous for us to think that this is this was a new concept and that new concept therefore justifies block periodization. You know, every Roman legionnaire or Spartan soldier knew that, well, if I train, lots of things will happen. And if I stop, those things will unhappen. So, so that's kind of a scientific sleight of hand that kind of academics do sometimes in my book. So sorry, I, I went mm. off in one there, but residual effects is, is a really good one. There is no research, and I can't even think of how you design a study to find out, well, uh, James, if you did this type of training for six weeks, then it will last for this amount of time. Nobody's mm. ever going to be able to tell you that. What, else, what other type of training were you doing? Uh, what did you feel about the training? How stressed were you? Blah, 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 blah. A million yeah. individual factors. So many. And yeah, and how, you know, even hypothetically, if you could measure how you responded and how long it took to decay, that doesn't mean anything for your future. The next season, when you do it, it could be completely different because all these other non-physical factors have changed. And, yeah. and that's just the unfortunate truth. Um, so I, I guess what I would say is that for me, good coaching is about being brave, um, being brave and thinking there are no off the shelf answers for these difficult, complex questions. Mm. I need to figure it out from, you know, my brain, my context, my athletes. Uh, you need to I mean, the more of the research you know, the better, as long as you don't start believing it's actually true. Yeah. It's all true in the specific context of that study. But you have to look at lots of studies before you get a sense of reality. And mm. I know so, and I mean, everyone listening will be the same, exceptional coaches that never read a study in their lives. Mm -hmm. But they're great communicators, or they can, they can get athletes to yeah. fall in behind them. And I know people who are the opposite, really, really uh, well-versed, but no communication, self-presentation type skills, you know, didn't really connect with the athletes and it never worked for them. So no. that was a long kind of a dialogue there, sorry. No, that was that was a uh, a perfect way to end this. I know you're going you're gonna to shoot off soon, but if anyone wants to find you and follow your work, John, when can they do that? Uh, I'm on Twitter at Simply Sports Sci. Uh, I'm on Instagram as well. I'm, I'm not great on either of them, but I'm, I'm there. Uh, and I work for the University of Limerick. If anyone wants to drop me a line, you know, they can feel free to do that. They're john.kiley, K I E L Y, at ul.com. Oh, perfect. That's perfect. All right. And, and we'll leave that there. But thank you for coming on, John. I really appreciate it. My pleasure. Thanks for asking.